If you were to book a holiday tomorrow and travel to Tanzania, you probably wouldn't expect to see a 107-year-old former German passenger steamship sailing on a lake. But you'd be in for a pleasant surprise, because motoring around doing weekly crossings on Lake Tanganyika is the MV Liemba, which was once upon a time the SS Graf von Goetzen. But just how was a 230-foot, 1,500-ton steamship constructed on the banks of a lake where there were no large-scale shipyards? Well, it kind of wasn't. Graf von Goetzen was designed and built in Germany, then transported in pieces by ship and railroad to East Africa, where it was unboxed and reassembled. This is the wild, true story of the Graf von Goetzen, the ship that was unboxed. This story has its origins in the 19th century, when the European powers were doing their best to one-up each other by carving out huge chunks of land across the globe in remote locations, planting a nice little flag and then declaring that they belonged to the empire. Except, of course, nobody seemed to ask what the indigenous people thought about it. Africa became hot real estate and everybody needed a piece. As always, Britain and France were there, and Germany was keen to form a toehold on the continent. What resulted included German East Africa, a colony made up of modern-day Burundi, Rwanda, and Tanzania. Servicing the colony was the German East Africa Railway, but there was a slight hitch. Separating German East Africa from the Belgian Congo was Lake Tanganyika, the second largest freshwater lake in the world, some 33,000 square kilometers or 12,700 square miles large, with an average depth of 1,870 feet. The lake is certainly no pond, and the Germans figured that ships could operate in conjunction with the railway to ferry passengers and cargo quickly and efficiently to various ports along the way. Now this is all well and good, except the infrastructure just wasn't there. Kigoma, the largest port city, had dock facilities, cranes, and a shipyard large enough only for constructing smaller boats and craft. But the German plan was much more ambitious. It called for a relatively large steamer, which could make regular sailings, carrying a crew of 64 men. The ship would feature seven first-class cabins and five second-class, with dining and smoking rooms for both classes to boot. There was just no way a ship like that, though, could be built from scratch at the Kigoma Yard. The yard itself could be grown to handle a ship that big, but the skilled labour was lacking. Shipbuilding is like a fine art, and the German East African shipbuilders weren't fully across the nuances of building a large ship from bare steel from the ground up. What they could do, though, was assemble prefabricated parts using red-hot iron rivets, kind of like a giant Meccano set. With that in mind, in 1913, the Meyer Werft shipyard in Papenburg, Germany, received the contract and designed and built the SS Graf von Goetzen, 234 feet long and 1,500 tons. But they didn't fully complete it. The ship was assembled, but the cabins, decor, and many of the internal fittings weren't fitted, and instead of using rivets, the ship's hull was only temporarily held together with screws. Reviewed by two staff of the German East African Railway and a representative of the German Reich Colonial Office, the new ship was found to be fit for purpose and accepted in November 1913. With all found to be well and good, the screws were removed and the hull was totally disassembled, and the thousands of individual components, frames, hull plates and beams were packed carefully into crates and shipped off to German East Africa. The crates, all 5,000 of them, were landed by three steamships at Dar es Salaam on the east coast of Africa, where they were loaded onto train cars of the German East African Railway. It's long been repeated that the crates arrived short of Kigoma, the port city, and that they had to be carried by local porters to the city, but this is probably untrue because the central train line had been extended to Kigoma proper with work completed on February 1st, 1914, while the ship's crates arrived for transport on the 16th of that month. Along for the ride were three Maya Werft engineers, who were all being handsomely paid to supervise the work, earning 600 marks a month at a time when the average worker earned just 100. There at Kigoma, a mixed team of 250 local Africans and 20 Indians from the railway worked under the supervision of the Maya Werft engineers to reassemble the steamship in the correct order. First the keel plates, then the frames, beams and girders, the shell plating, and then the ship's engines. She received a pair of 250 horsepower triple expansion steam engines, powering twin screws to propel the ship at a service speed of 10 or 11 knots. The cabins were installed, along with cavernous holds to store up to 480 tonnes of cargo. She received insulated cold storage, a carbonic ice machine that could make up to 3 kilograms of ice per hour, 
and all up, some 160,000 rivets were used to assemble the ship, and work continued on through 1914. But then, there came some concerning news. Conflict had broken out in Europe, and Germany was now at war with two of the nations whose colonies bordered on German East Africa, Britain and Belgium. Completing the new steamer was now more important than ever, but something was wrong. A slipway large enough to traditionally launch the ship was prefabricated back in Germany, and would have comprised 13 80-ton train wagon loads of material, except that the war's outbreak meant that the slip couldn't be delivered. The launch would have to be improvised, so a sort of dry dock was dug around the ship's hull so that it gradually settled lower into the mud, and when the work was finally finished, the riverside wall was breached and water freely poured in. On February 5th, 1915, the ship was lifted up and afloat at last. An impressive endeavour, to be sure. It was named the Graf von Goetzen, after one of German East Africa's governors. Sea trials were conducted on the lake, after all the work was completed in May, and the captain's opinion was, well, not great. His list of complaints included that the ship had insufficient draught, that portion of the ship which is underwater, meaning that it rolled badly. There were too few trim options, meaning that the ship was difficult to balance using water tanks. The bulkheads were too few and too weak. The engines weren't powerful enough and caused strong vibrations. The steering gear was prone to failure and the funnel was horribly inefficient. But despite these drawbacks, the von Goetzen was exactly the kind of ship that the Germans needed on Lake Tanganyika at that exact time because it helped solidify their control of the surrounding region. With Europe's powers now at war, the ship could be used to carry troops and supplies across the lake, mounting surprise attacks on the Belgian colony in the Congo, or resupplying and reinforcing friendly positions on the eastern bank in the German colony. She was the largest ship afloat on the lake, and something of a fleet in being. No time was wasted, and she was commissioned into the German navy in 1915, and renamed SMS Goetzen. Conversion into an auxiliary cruiser went ahead and the ship received a 10.5 cm gun from the recently decommissioned German cruiser Königsberg, along with an 88mm gun and two 37mm Hotchkiss guns from the survey ship Merva. Von Goetzen was a rude surprise for the British because its operation meant that German troops were spared what would have been a two-week overland march between Kigoma and what is now Kasanga in Tanzania. The Germans now had unchallenged superiority of the lake and for the British, destroying the ship was now of the utmost priority but it would not be easy. For one, the Goetzen itself was pretty formidably armed for what was essentially a glorified riverboat, and the British had nothing near that level of firepower afloat that could go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a naval battle. Second, the Goetzen was backed up by two smaller German ships on the lake, the 50-ton gunboat Kingani and the 60-ton Hedwig von Wismann, which had actually sunk a Belgian steamer at the start of the war. The ships all supported German raids on the British-held Rhodesia and became a major thorn in the Allies' side. If the British and Belgians attacked German East Africa, Goetzen and the two smaller ships could pounce, cutting off supply lines and communications. Then in 1915, the British big game hunter and prospector, John R. Lee, for whom I cannot find a photograph and we'll just use this one instead, came up with a plan. See, Lee had heard rumblings firsthand that local tribes had developed some German sympathies, and that simply would not do, because it could help sway the local conflict in the direction that the Germans wanted. Lee approached the British Admiralty with a plan that can only be described as insane. Germany's boats controlled the lake and the Belgians and the British had no way of building anything large enough to answer them. But size, in this case, was not the most important factor. See, Lee figured that you could take a small motorboat, fit it with quick-firing guns and then transport it intact to Lake Tanganyika so that there wouldn't need to be any reconstruction period where a surprise attack from the Germans could end the efforts in disaster. The plan would see the gunboats travel from England to Cape Town, South Africa, aboard a steamship, which is some 6,100 miles, then from Cape Town to Elizabethville by rail, a distance of 1,800 miles, then a 142-mile trip by rail to Fungarume, then by oxen, local porters and traction engines for 120 miles to Sankizia. And after that, there was another 15-mile rail voyage to Bukama, where the boats would sail under their own power along the Lualaba River until they reached Kabalo where there was yet another rail journey of 175 miles to Lukuga, which was on Lake Tanganyika. The plan must have seemed absurd, but Admiral Sir Henry Jackson loved it and responded in the most British way possible that it is both the duty and the tradition of the Royal Navy to engage the enemy wherever there is water to float a ship. Two motor launchers which had been built for the Greek army were selected and commandeered for the task. 
They were made of mahogany, 40 feet long, and powered by 100 horsepower engines each that gave them a top speed of around 19 knots. They were fitted with 3-inch Hotchkiss guns and Maxim machine guns, and gunfire tests showed that the Hotchkiss could only be fired from an awkward kneeling position, and in one of the tests, the gunner and his gun were thrown clean into the River Thames after firing a test shot because the Hotchkiss hadn't been bolted properly onto the deck. Despite this, they were found to be fit for purpose, and the plan actually went into effect. Thus began an epic 16,000 kilometer or 10,000 mile journey, which would see the two small boats lugged all over Africa, and even up a 1,800 meter or 5,900 foot high mountain range. Finally reaching Lake Tanganyika, the two small boats, named Mimi and Tutu, which is French for Miao and Bow Wow, were actually discovered early on by the German commander of the gunboat Kingami, who swam ashore to investigate the activity under cover of darkness while his ship stood too, but he was captured by Belgian patrol. He somehow managed to smuggle out a message warning of the threat, but it would not reach the Germans and Kingoma for some months yet. So Mimi and Tutu set out on their mission, and at 6 in the morning on December 26, 1915, the crew of the German gunboat Kingami were rudely shocked to see the two small motorboats flying the British flag sailing straight at them. Scheiße. Kingami's CO ordered his ship sail full steam away from the threat, but his only gun could only fire forward, leaving his boat totally vulnerable to the British boats. Some shots from the British killed the CO and some of his crew, and the chase ended when Kingami's chief engineer surrendered the boat. The British assumed control and renamed it Fifi, which is French for Tweet Tweet. The British force on Lake Tanganyika had now grown with the addition of this new boat, and the Germans were dismayed that Kingani had gone missing. A few weeks later, in mid-January, the other German gunboat, the Hedwig von Wismann, sailed out to investigate what was going on and was met with a ragtag bunch of boats, including Tutu, Mimi and Fifi, and after an exchange of gunfire, the Hedwig was mortally wounded. Taking on water, its CO ordered the ship abandoned and explosive charges were planted to render it unusable to the enemy. This left only the Gertsen as the sole German survivor on the lake, but she was by far the biggest and the most dangerous. The next day, the German ship steamed past looking for the Hedwig, but the British CO forbade an attack, because he had a different plan. He had actually sourced a ship of similar size to the Gertsen to be disassembled and rebuilt on the lake for reinforcement. Over the next few weeks and months, the German position on Lake Tanganyika and the surrounding region deteriorated. With yet more British boats and even float plane bombers arriving to support, the Germans stripped Gertsen of her armament and gave the guns to the army instead. Realising that the situation was hopeless, Gertsen was set to be scuttled, and was sunk on purpose so that the enemy couldn't make use of her. Before she was sunk though, her machinery and her parts were coated in grease so they could be used again if the need ever arose. And she was filled with sand, her sea valves were opened, and the Gertsen sank in 20 metres of water near Katabe Bay. With Germany's defeat in the First World War, the country's colonies in Africa were disbanded, and German East Africa ceased to be. Gertsen was raised in 1918 by a Swedish engineer working with the Belgians, and she was towed to Kingoma, but the project went nowhere and the ship was left half submerged again. It wasn't until 1924 that the British, who had by then assumed control of the former German colony, fully raised the ship and repaired it for service. Renamed the steamship Liemba, the vessel finally now served as a passenger steamer and cargo ship operating across the lake, although in British and not German hands. Incredibly, after over a century, the former SS Gertsen, now the diesel-powered motor vessel Liemba, still sails Lake Tanganyika, a vital link between the various ports of the lake, offering weekly sailings for paying passengers. The ship's hull is battered and pitted from decades of hard service, but she is one of the world's oldest serving passenger ships and the last floating vessel of the Kaiser's Imperial Navy. She is a maritime legend, the ship that was unboxed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, like and subscribe to the channel. Every bit helps, and I put out a new video every week, so you'd hate to miss out. If you'd like to support my work, please subscribe to me on Patreon, or you can sign up for a YouTube membership for perks like early access, behind the scenes, and many more. You'll find the link in the description below. As always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.